Good, mor well, good morning, golly me, let's adjust the head here. Uh, can I say good afternoon and welcome to the eighth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing of 2014. I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. No apologies have been received. And I welcome uh, Roddy Campbell, member of the Justice Committee, to the meeting. Item one, the subcommittee is invited to agree to consider a work programme under item three in private. Are you agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Item two on armed police. This is an evidence session on armed police. Now, welcome to the meeting. Vic Emery, Chair of the SPA and White SPA Board Member. Derek Penman, HM Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland. This is your second outing this week. And uh, Dr Brian Plasto, Lead Inspector with HMICS. Can I thank you for your latest correspondence providing details of the SPA scrutiny inquiry and HMICS assurance review relating to firearms deployment and as we have the information before us, unless you have anything you additionally want to add, I see nobody has anything additionally want to add, go straight to questions from members John and Graham. Yeah, uh, uh, first questions to, to Mr Penman, if I may, please. Th thanks for all the documentation. It's been very helpful. Uh, in particular, I, I like uh, the reference in your, your document, Mr Penman, to the wider community impact and human rights legislation has been incorporated in the decision-making process. I think that's terribly important. Um, can you give us an assurance about presumed statements thus far and ones you'll receive that they will be challenged and um, not just because the Chief says so? I, I say that because it's my understanding there's a lot of unhappy officers and there's a culture of an unwillingness to challenge decisions for fear of being in charge of paper clips after you do challenge. Indeed, I advise some may be in charge of paper clips. And do you... Um, plan to speak to officers other than those listed in your re review because there are a number of officers who are doing operation duties who aren't happy that armed officers are appearing on the scene for minor incidents. Who wants to answer that first of all? Mr. Mr. Penn. Yeah, no, thank you for that uh, question. Part of our methodology that we have uh, put forward is to identify um, officers, they would include the ARV officers um, from there. Uh, I, I think we've got flexibility in our programme and I'd be more than happy to include uh, officers um, who are working alongside um, the armed officers and also commanders and, and other officers within the force just to seek their views on that. So I'll give you an assurance that we will include that as part of our review. OK, thanks very much. In many respects, Camina, I, I think this is perhaps uh, a bit premature as scrutinising because I'm, you know, I think it's the, the review that will be interesting. But um, as part of that, Mr Penn, w w will you be able to provide the committee with a timeline of who to took what decisions and when? Because I have to say there has been varying representations of that um, from Police Scotland. Um, and also... Can I just clarify, who took decisions and when? I want to know on what? Oh, yes, oh, I beg your pardon. On, the, if you like, the stage change that's seen us move from a situation where initially one, then two, we're told three, and then overnight eight, all move to a situation of um, standing authority. So the, the timeline for that... Yep. As part of our review and our methodology, I think on page 11, we have uh, undertaken to look at what were the legacy force policies and procedures and deployment criteria. And the reason for that is exactly as you, uh, you point out, is I think it would be, be helpful to paint that picture for everyone to understand what existed prior to Police Scotland, what changes then took effect, um, because in many respects I think it was those changes that have uh, triggered the community interest uh, around that. Um, the Police Authority uh, also uh, have asked us to look at the notification processes that Police Scotland did as part of um, bringing this policy through. Uh, and again, as part of our methodology, we will look at what steps Police Scotland did and how they engaged with the authority and report publicly uh, on that. Thank you. Um, yes, I was going to ask the SP if they want to answer. You have a separate review, haven't you? Do you want to answer that part as well? Well, I was just concentrating on the... Inspector okay, beg your pardon. Well, then, I'll, well, yes, convener. let me thank, not interfere, thank, thank please. So go on. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, again, Mr. Penn, when you talk about identifying good practice uh, that can be applied across Scotland, you, your predecessors in your post um, had a, a, a duty to ensure that all the legacy forces, I believe the term, um, would have operated efficiently, and they all had different arrangements. So that good practice could be a reversion. <laughs> to some of these arrangements, which clearly got a clear bill of health from your predecessors. Yeah, what we'll look at, um, probably there's two stages which might be helpful at this stage um, in our, our evidence to explain. The first part is the decision by which the Chief Constable will arrive at the need for a standing authority. Um, and that's effectively whether or not there is um, sufficient threat intelligence that would justify officers having immediate access to firearms. 
The second part for me is very much around the how, having that decision been taken, how are those officers then deployed um, across Scotland and, and also the carriage uh, of firearms for us. So what we will look at is the good practice in relation to the deployment of armed response officers. That will be caught up as part of the legacy, so what happened previously in Scotland. But I think it's also important for us to look beyond Scotland and to the rest elsewhere in the United Kingdom to see what is recognised as good practice there as well, and again feed that back into our report. If I may, that, that leads me into our next two or three questions, and that revolves around the term national guidance. And I'm not trying to embroil you in some sort of constitutional uh, discussion, but by national guidance, that's meant UK guidance. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. Section 55 of the Firearms Act 1968 uh, is the legislative framework that allows the, the Chief Constable um, to deploy firearms for a policing purpose. There is then a national guidance that now comes through its uh, approved professional practice from the College of Policing, uh, which is um, they effectively hold that doctrine. Um, Scottish policing has been involved over the years in developing that doctrine alongside other UK forces, but it is UK uh, recognised practice uh, in terms of firearms. Okay, w w without rehearsing the number of documents, which I'm, I'm sure you'll be aware of, um, your, your predecessor in 2009 talks about compliance voluntarily with these. If that's changed, will your report highlight why that's changed and who decided based on what? Yeah, we can certainly take them on board and demonstrate what the rest of the framework <coughs> is. Um, for that. W one of the step changes actually in order to um, deploy firearms uh, there must be accredited training and the force that provides that training must be accredited. Each of the commanders and firearms officers must be trained and accredited and that's now done to UK guidance through the College of Policing. So that ties effectively Scotland in to that UK framework. But we can certainly provide explanations of that within our report. Thank you. Um, I've, I've previously asked questions about the tactic I understand was referred as hard stop which was applied in the fatal shooting of Mark Duggan and the, the Police Commands Commission south of the border make recommendations of that. Is that the sort of background you'd be looking to see that good practice has been applied and picked up on because there was a suggestion that it wasn't immediately responded to by forces in England and Wales? The hard stop is one of a number of tactics that would be deployed uh, in armed policing. Um, to be honest, that's not really within the scope of our review at present. What we're interested in is around the standing authority and the deployment of um, that officers who have that standing authority and how they are also linking into local policing, as opposed to looking at all the various tactics that may or may not apply in armed policing. That wasn't within the scope of our review. Yes, no, I understand that. It was more with having regard to um, consequences of applying the, uh, of the UK position. You know, so, so there has been criticism of that tactic. Yeah, I'm, so I'm, not, I'm not aware of the detail of, uh, of that criticism. What we say that the safeguards do, that, that's effectively about the, the deployment of the firearms as well. And there are other checks and balances across Scotland in the form of the, um, the PERC, uh, who would look at that and, and also be able to comment. So in terms of the firearms being used, then the PERC would be involved in, in doing that, probably under the direction of the Crown as well. But it, 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 I don't see us looking at the tactics of the ARV officers as part of a review. OK, thank you. My final question to you, Mr Penman, is are you able to give the committee an assurance that none of your staff who will be involved in this inquiry have previously been involved in decisions about um, the standing authorisation? I can certainly give the commitment that none of the staff involved in this will have been previously involved in any decisions uh, involving Police Scotland um, standing authority uh, in relation to that. I'm grateful for that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Graham, to follow by Margaret, Alison and Kevin. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks, convener. First thing about the College of uh, Policing authorised professional practice, I checked the, the site this morning. It indicates in the site that the doctrine has not as yet been extended to Scotland and is still subject to uh, discussions. Uh, is that your understanding? Uh, my, my understanding is that the, um, the guidance within there is, is effectively practised uh, within um, policing in Scotland um, because in order to get the accreditation to train and effectively to deploy, um, then that uh, has to be done through the College of Policing. Um, so, but uh, you did, would accept that it says on the site this morning it's not as yet been uh, extended to Scotland and it's still subject of discussions? That, that, if it's on the site, that may be the case. Certainly, what we, are going, to, what we are going to do is, is we're going to work alongside the College of Policing and also DCC Simon Chesterman, who is ACPO lead, um, and obviously we'll, we will make sure that all these areas are covered as part of our review. The point is that a lot has been said about authorised professional practice in the various say, correspondence, mm -hmm. as if it's a doctrine which has been fully uh, expanded and examined and is now almost 
law, if I could use that term in terms of internal practice, but it's still subject of, of discussion. Second point that we make is that Justice Committee on 27th of November 2012, your predecessor described operational independence as a grey area uh, and it was also commented as fuzzy and it was acknowledged during that uh, committee that clarity would be required uh, uh, through the process of discussion. Uh, have you been involved in any formal discussions in relation to operational independence? And if you have, can we have copies of the minutes of those discussions so we can see the direction it's going? Um, the answer is I have not been involved in any formal discussions <coughs> um, around um, the operational independence um, and given evidence to the Justice Committee on Tuesday uh, I took the opportunity uh, to say that one of the areas I think that requires further work and the timing is now right for that is scrutiny and I think that is a discussion nationally uh, to look at all levels of scrutiny not just uh, operational uh, autonomy of the Chief Constable but the accountability to authority and indeed how scrutiny bodies such as myself link into that. Mr. Uh, I've got to say it's, it's a matter of regret that in the intervening almost two years such an important issue hasn't been subject of discussion and examination given what we are now debating and the amount of uh, concern that's been expressed publicly. In that context, if I can ask Mr Emery, um, I watched the uh, board's meeting, the SPA board meeting, uh, the last one where the subject of uh, armed response came up. Uh, I've got to say I was disappointed that almost from the outset, without any examination of the Chief Constable's position, there seemed to be an acknowledgement that operational independence applied in these circumstances. And uh, other than Mr White, who raised a number of pertinent issues about communication, the discussion thereafter seemed to be post-decision making. Could you tell us what your understanding of operational independence is and whether you believe it was applied properly in these circumstances. If properly applied, why? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, as you know, the Act uh, makes it quite clear that the Chief Constable has operational independence, <clears throat> that, and that is actually intended to be independent from any political in influence. Um, it, there is a a maturity of our arrangements with the, with the police as to the extent to which the SPA become involved in the decisions that the, police con the Chief Constable makes. The, um, the scrutiny role that we have is very much after the fact, uh, and that is not really my view of governance, and uh, I think I've expressed that to this committee various times uh, when we've met previously. And, and, we need so, to move, okay. and we need to move on to a situation where we are consulted in advance of policy decisions being made rather than simply uh, scrutinising those decisions after the fact. And I, I acknowledge that. And I recently responded to a letter that you wrote to me uh, actually uh, expressing that view in my letter to you. Mr White, yes, as you were named, let's... Convener, thank you. I, I, I think it might be helpful to go to the uh, nature of the inquiry that we're carrying out, and, and some of that inquiry is indeed scrutiny of the decision-making that's taking place. But if you'll see that our fourth bullet point of our, our remit of the inquiry we're undertaking is to see what, if any, lessons might be learned around how operational decisions and wider strategic or community impact are communicated to national and local oversight bodies and other key interests. We want to improve the way that, that scrutiny of the Chief Constable and operational decisions uh, is, is undertaken. And some of that is, uh, as uh, Vic has said, is about upfront uh, scrutiny and, and oversight of those decisions prior to policies being implemented. Okay. Going back to the comment in 2012, uh, can the, either of you indicate what discussions you've had since 2012 on the issue of operational independence uh, and who with, uh, and could we have access to the minutes of any of those discussions? We haven't had formal discussions that are minuted, but we have had a growing improvement in our relationship uh, with the police, and this is a matter of persuading the police that they need to come forward and consult with the board, particularly on how decisions are communicated amongst the community, 
uh, before those decisions are made. And we are maturing that relationship, as I've, as I've said to you slowly. We need to mature that because the Act can be literally interpreted as being a scrutiny after the fact. Uh, and, and that is not a satisfactory situation, and I think we all acknowledge that. And we're trying to move to a position where we are involved prior to these decisions being made. Could, could you indicate when the Chief Constable first consulted with you as a convener on the issue of extending the use of armed uh, police officers on routine duties? The, the Chief Constable um, communicated with me at the Selkirk board meeting. Uh, there is a document which was issued um, uh, quite a long time ago. You may know, Derek. There was, there was a document that was produced, I think, for the day one readiness. It was yes. presented to the board in which a reference was contained in it. Yeah, there was a, there was a one-line reference to, in a document of a number of things that were being rolled out <clears throat> in readiness for day one. Uh, which, as we all know, went through very successfully. In fact, most of the public didn't actually notice the difference between the Legacy Forces and Police Scotland. But it was one item amongst a catalogue of items that were uh, communicated at that time. Just a date, please. Um, Sorry? A date, a date. Um, my, my recollection April would last be year. that it was March or April uh, 2013. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. But I think... If I understand the way you've commented there, that that one-line reference wouldn't amount to uh, seeking any consent or, or approval of the current situation. Uh, again, that it, if you read the, um, the review uh, of the... Uh, of, uh, well, the um, prospectus of the review that uh, Derek Penman and HMIC are going to take, carry out, plus the added review of the SPA, that is one of the, the questions that we want um, exposed. Okay. The nature of a standing authorisation, um, reading the documentation that uh, refers to it, uh, indicates officers who are on specific duties and where uh, a risk uh, is identified and, and demands the, the requirement for officers to be permanently armed. Um, in the discussions that you had at Selkirk, uh, were you satisfied that it was necessary for officers performing routine duties anywhere in Scotland would require to wear uh, automatic pistols uh, as a, a normal way of duty? What risk assessment was presented to you at that stage that persuaded you that that was fine? Uh, that, that was not uh, discussed in that level of detail, as you will probably know, because, uh, as you've said, you, you watched it through, um, and, uh, and therefore there was no risk assessment offered to uh, uh, the SPA uh, in that respect. Could you share with me, did the Cabinet se uh, Secretary speak to you about the issue of uh, the controversy of armed police uh, or given that the Cabinet Secretary seems to have been told about this a year ago, were you told in the interim period that such a conversation had occurred? I'm sorry, a conversation between whom? Apparently the Chief Constable briefed the Cabinet Secretary Where's last from? year. Where's this from? Just if you'll give it us came from the Chamber in a reply in the Chamber. Thank you, just so we know. But the Cabinet so Secretary we... indicated that the Chief Constable had briefed him on this matter uh, in his office. Give us a reference so we know where it went, so that we can it would for be, the report. Uh, about five weeks ago in the chamber. Uh, during justice the questions uh, or a debate. Uh, during justice questions. Okay. Um, so, can you tell me when did the ca when, if ever, did the cabinet secretary discuss the issue of armed officers on routine patrol in Scotland? I, I have not discussed with the cabinet secretary that issue. Thank you very much. I think it would be very helpful if you can give us the reference, as that's a very sort of pertinent and question, and you've been asked to answer it. And I move to Margaret, followed by Alison, followed by Kevin. Good afternoon. Um, the, the College of Police Authorised Professional Practice has been quoted quite a lot. That's for armed, that, the armed policing document for the UK. It looks at the management compan, uh, command and deployment of armed officers in the rest of the UK and I think it is very relevant to assess um, how they deploy their armed officers and it seems to be that it would be high risk locations engaged in armed response vehicle duties or undertaking protection duties. 
Um, could the panel confirm if they're aware in the rest of the UK if there's ever a situation where armed forces turn up at incidents that by no stretch of the imagination could fall under these uh, three headings? Because that really is the nub of the concern from the public and I think this committee. If, if I can, the, the, the reference to armed response vehicles is um, if effectively those vehicles that are available um, basically 24-7 uh, across Scotland and indeed the UK where officers have access to firearms. The standing authority is effectively to give them the, the, the authority to have those uh, weapons on them uh, as opposed to being locked away in the vehicle. The way that these ARVs are deployed will vary across the country. And one of the areas that we intend to look at is exactly that, is... Um, if they are not deployed on ARV duties, are they employed doing something else um, around that? And that is some of the work that we will look to try and gather and then bring back in to show how that might vary across the country. Is there a distinction between that and specific high-risk locations, which I would imagine was a case-by-case case as the situation arose, and um, undertaking protection duties? Yeah, but if effectively, the, the, uh, the, chief, the Chief Constable, um, in order to give a standing authority, must be satisfied that there's an operational requirement for it, um, and that would be uh, informed by what's called a strategic um, firearms risk assessment, and that would effectively show what are the risks, what are the intelligence that would justify that. In the main, that is what we will be involved uh, in looking at how Police Scotland um, review that next month. But the other areas that you look at would have specific risk assessments done for them at that time, so areas that require to have protective security would have a specific risk around them at that time. Areas in relation to airports, for example, would also be uh, looked at with a separate risk around them at that time. Our review is very much going to focus on armed response vehicles and the extent to which they are also in support of other duties. Uh, does the panel accept there's a kind of heightened concern uh, about all of this because we do have a single police force. This decision has been taken by one individual under um, what he's referred to as operational um, his competence and his complete control over that and the lack of checks and balances, I think, is the thing which we are now hearing from Mr Emery um, is hi highly um, unsatisfactory to be informed of something as high profile and as, as dynamic as this um, after the event. If any press, replies, uh, press comments are looked at, it's always referred to as a policy. And I have to say, to me, it looks very much like a policy. If it barks, it's got four legs and a waggy tail, it's a dog. And it's a little like that with um, this particular uh, policy. So are we going to dance in semantics here? Or is the panel going to look at and ask this particular Mr Penman because in some of your comments you seem to have accepted the policy or operational um, decision. Is the, the panel on the various reviews going to be looking into the appropriateness? Is there any suggestion, and I certainly would welcome this given that one armed officer attending a duty where they should not have or be in possession of a gun is one armed officer too many. Is there any possibility of suspending this policy until the reviews are completed? Because we're looking to, I think, December before this is completed. And every single day, we've got armed officers in Scotland with guns where they shouldn't be. I think the benefit there, which is fair enough, is, is it a policy, is it operational? And if it's a policy, is it going to be suspended during your review? The, the, the quotes you referred to were quotes that I had put out um, earlier in response to a, a, re, a regional newspaper um, who were seeking that, and, and my, my, my view at that time was that the decision around the standing authority is an operational decision for the Chief Constable, and at that time it had followed guidance um, from that. For me, there was also the part there about separating that from uh, the deployment and how the officers are actually used. Um, in terms of our review, um, we will be involved in the Chief Constable himself as required under the guidance to review that decision uh, as an annual basis, but they've undertaken to do it quarterly. So we will be involved uh, at the next stage uh, to the extent that we will be able to witness um, the decision-making process and the evidence that the Chief Constable has to make that decision. Uh, uh, that's an annual review that hasn't taken place so far, given the decision was made over, an, uh, over a year ago. The, the, the guidance is for an annual review, but Police Scotland have undertaken to do that on a quarterly basis, and the next quarterly review uh, is, on, no so far. is on the 16th of September. Um, I'll 
to yeah. share, I think. Yeah, yeah. Could, can I maybe come in that point, if it's yes. helpful? Um, there's probably four key research questions that we will ask during our uh, uh, work. The first one is, was the initial um, standing authority approved by the Chief Constable justified by the analysis of threat, risk and harm in the um, Police Scotland uh, strategic risk assessment at that time? We don't know the answer to that question yet because we haven't looked at it, but we will look at it. We will also look at the FSTRA for the current year. So it's a bit about looking back, a bit about looking now. In essence, that's a yes, no answer. The intelligence will either tell us that you know um, there was justification or there wasn't. From that, the next logical question is, if the intelligence was there, why was the decision taken to go for overt carriage of weapons and what other um, options were considered? This should all be documented. Uh, we will also want to know what community impact assessment and um, consultation took place around that. And in, in the last um, probably important strand is around deployment criteria. So having taken a decision to grant a standing authority, having taken a decision to go for avert carriage, what deployment criteria were put in for officers to, to ameliorate some of the, the public concerns that have emerged. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. That's very helpful, that's very helpful actually. Um, but is there any move to re review this and suspend this um, decision just now, given the widespread concern? And we're not going to be reporting to December. That's an awful long time for these um, police officers to be out in the street with guns where they shouldn't be, in my view. Uh, in possession of firearms. The, 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 the Chief Constable is undertaking the review on the 16th of September. That would be the decision by the Chief Constable then as to whether or not that would continue. We'll be party of that, uh, as Brian has said, in terms of being able to report. We would be looking to provide a report um, by the 21st of October, uh, and that would allow the authority at their meeting on the 29th of October to consider that report and also any report from the Chief Constable around his decision uh, around deployment. Want to, don't want to upset you there, Margaret. Yes. It might be helpful <laughs> to say just, that... Oh, sorry, just a little bit while we resolve our friendship. Okay. Mr White. The, it, it might be helpful to say that the SPA inquiry uh, is looking at things in a slightly different way, and that I think uh, the complementary nature of the two inquiries is actually quite innovative in, in terms of looking at Scottish policing. We're using uh, the relevant skills there. But what we'll be looking at is... Uh, what the public reaction around this has been and what the public concerns genuinely are. Uh, sometimes in the media it's, it's characterised as a debate about whether there should be specialist armed policing. And I think we all agree there has to be a small number of specialist armed policing for, for uh, reasons of threat and risk. And on other occasions it's characterised as the routine arming of all police officers, which it's not. So uh, Mrs Mitchell's point about actually the tasking and deployment of those officers once they're armed will be a very critical point that we will be looking into and people's concerns about that. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Alison, followed by Kevin. Thank you, and just pursue um, these issues a bit further. Um, Mr Penman, you, you said that you made that statement on the 30th of July, you know, talking about the author standing authority, but you did go further than that and you did say that using specialist officers to support frontline officers is efficient use of resources. And I wonder how you're going to demonstrate that the assurance review is objective, given that statement. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, what, what my quote was actually to say that uh, appropriate deployment um, was what uh, I had said um, in that press statement. And the appropriateness, I think, comes to understanding what exactly these officers are being deployed to do um, from that. So part of our review will be to look at what are the, the guidelines and policies around the deployment of these officers, basically to, to non-firearms-related tasks and the extent to which they support their local colleagues, because, to be fair, I'm not clear across the country yet what they, um, what they are. And once we have a picture of that, we also want to look across the UK to see what is recognised best practice um, around that. I mean, um, so, and again, hopefully that will give the assurance then in terms of a report uh, what it is officers are actually doing. Okay, um, if you turn to the, um, the statement of your review, um, the aim of your review in the paper that relates to that, you've said this review is scheduled for 16th of September and provides an opportunity for HMICS to make an objective professional assessment that the operational decision making by Police Scotland has followed the relevant guidance and that any conclusion is supported. Should that not be whether the operational decision rather than, I mean, it rather sounds as if you've made an assumption at this stage that uh, 
that. So we know it's perhaps in the, the drafting of uh, of that, and again using the word assurance, uh, it's not to be read as reassurance. Uh, it's about us providing you with uh, and authority with assurance around that. Again, I would point out that the 16th is only one specific part of our review, and that is looking at whether or not um, the intelligence and, and the threat uh, justifies the Chief Constable to uh, have a standing authority. Um, and that will be done against whatever guidance is there. We will be privy to um, that information that the Chief is looking at at that time uh, and will be in a position to say uh, effectively whether that is, is reasonable um, under the circumstances. We have also undertaken to go beyond that, which is about saying, you know, it's one, one thing, that the, the standing authority in there, because people need to have immediate access to firearms, and I think that's an issue you have to separate. The next bit is, to what extent can they be used for other things when they're not doing that? And that really is, I think, the nub uh, of all of this, uh, and probably is what's causing the, the greatest concern among communities, and that's an area that we would look to focus on in particular. I think that's um, particularly welcome. I wonder if I could ask Mr Emery... Um, about operational independence, because that's really what's at the heart of, of the difficulties here. If the Chief Constable asserts that a matter, any matter, is an operational one, do you feel obliged to accept that? Uh, we we um, make recommendations and ask the Chief Constable. Normally, we see these things after the fact, and I think we've, we've been through that today. Uh, and... And the Act is quite specific in saying that the Chief Constable is accountable for the operational decisions that he makes, and he is, he is accountable to the SPA for doing that. But under the Act, we can ask him to give due consideration to our views. Yeah, but you're also responsible for ensuring that the Chief Constable uh, adheres to the policing principles, and that would allow you to investigate things in advance of the fact, we would ask, allow you to say to the Chief Constable, we would like to, you to come and uh, explain what you're thinking about doing about something that would allow you to look into almost any policy matter, given that the policing principles are at the core of all of that. And that perhaps the Board needs to um, be a little bit more proactive in terms of where you think the areas of challenge might come in the future. I mean, given the industrial scale of stop and search and this particular distinct policy change on armed policing. These are two things that clearly very few of us think are operational matters, purely and simply. Um, and we absolutely need to get to a point where, where we can better understand what we mean by operational independence. As I understand it, there's no statutory definition of operational independence. Um, and I think people tend to rely on a judgment by Lord Denning, which says no minister of the crown can tell him that he must, that's the chief constable, must or must not keep observation on this place or that, or that he must or must not prosecute this man or that man, nor can any police authority. But there's a long way between that and, and you know, just hiding behind operational independence on, on policy changes. So do you think there's some benefit in developing written guidance after much consultation, both in civic society and within... Um, the police um, about how we how we take this forward. We would like to do a piece of work that says what operational decisions do we need to be involved in and which ones do we not need to be involved in. That's a piece of work we want to go forward uh, to look at. As I've said, it is a developing relationship. It's a maturing relationship. Uh, but some of these operational decisions. Uh, the Chief Constable has made, and this one on, on firearms was actually rolled out uh, over a year ago. Yes, but don't you wish that um, perhaps instead of some of the earlier arguments that we had, that there had been a greater focus on, on this particular issue? Uh, well, as, as I've said to you, the, um, we need to be in advance of the decisions, I, I think I've already said, we need to be involved in why the decisions are being made and scrutinise in advance of what's happening rather than post the event. And, and the Act can be interpreted and is being interpreted as being after the event. Can, can, can I say, I, I'm, I'm glad you've raised the point about certain operational decisions that may be coming in the pipeline, whether we call them operational or policy, but they're in that difficult area that you'd wish to be involved in advance. But from a different point of view, I'd be very concerned if the SPA and HMICS interfered too much mm -hmm. 
in operational decisions because you are then tying the hands of chief counsel. And I think from my point of view, and I accept what my colleagues are saying, it's a difficult balance sometimes to maintain. But I'm pleased to hear that where there are very sensitive issues, as obviously some have been mentioned by the committee members, it would have been prudent uh, the, the very lowest of prudent for the SPA to be involved with the Chief Constable to discuss this in advance and the public at large. Would you concur in that? And, and Mate, you're making exactly the right d distinction between the two. Uh, the SPA is concerned if there is any public alarm or disquiet, which we foresee might happen as a result of a decision, but we don't want to be involved in all of the operational decisions. That's, we're not qualified to do that. I'd be most concerned. I, yes, Mr Penman. No, just, I think, as I said uh, on, on Tuesday, one of the areas I think that would benefit from further discussion um, across Scotland would be the, you know, what are the scrutiny levels around policing, you know, 16 months in um, to that as well. What I would say, though, that you know, there's a, there's a piece, although, although the, there is a doctrine of uh, constabular independence um, uh, from there, you know, in terms of the Police and Fire Reform Act, you know, the legislation is absolutely clear uh, around there that in under Section 2, um, the authority can hold the Chief Constable to account for the policing of Scotland. You know, under Section 17, uh, the, the Chief Constable has the direction of control, but he is also required to, um, to uh, sorry, he, he is responsible and uh, must account to the police authority. So the, the, the checks and balances are there. HMIC have a view because I'm not fettered in any way about what I can look at. I can also uh, feed in terms of the public opinion to what we see at risk. I can then uh, look at and inspect in those areas, provide reports which are public, give opportunities to the authority to provide scrutiny publicly, um, as are, are other agencies, including the PERC. So, you know, I think there is a framework here that allows for uh, the sort of effective governance of policing. I think there is something there about us just working through 16 months into that, about how that forms together. Um, thank you. I move on. Uh, Kevin, followed by Graham, and then John Finney again. Um, thank you very much, Convener. And can I first of all thank you, uh, gentlemen, for the two separate inquiries that you intend to carry out to address the concerns that have been made by, by members of, of the public. Um, I think Mr White says that uh, the, the two reviews are, are innovative, and uh, I'm glad to hear that's the case. And in some regards, this is uh, much different from what went on before uh, with eight police boards. And I think this shows that the level of scrutiny that there is has increased dramatically uh, since uh, that time. Um, one of the things which I, I am concerned about is some of the myths that have built up during the course uh, of this debate. Um, and I hope that you will be able to bust some of those myths uh, during the course of the review. Uh, and I hope you will be looking into those aspects and be able to reassure the public that we're not moving to an armed police service. Um, can, I, can I ask um, whether you will be looking um, at some of the, the past scenarios um, in terms uh, of armed policing? I, I, I know that in many cases... Um, arms were locked in vehicles, uh, which often caused difficulty in itself in, a, in access. So in terms of, of uh, your, your inquiry, you will be looking at what has happened in the past as well as what um, is, is now happening uh, all over Scotland instead of just the three authorities that had allowed this previously. Um, yeah, just as I said in, in response to uh, Mr Finney's question, p part of us is to try and look at, not try and look, we will look at um, what were the legacy arrangements prior to Police Scotland. I think it's helpful to explain the differences because the differences were it varied across the country where some people would have overtly have standing authority, where others would have dual role um, armed response vehicles and road policing where the guns would be contained within a locked cabinet. They still had uh, officers who were effectively had access to firearms but not immediate access to firearms. So the people, um, when they're out doing their duty, would not be picked up by members of the public. It varied across the country, so part of our work will be to provide a narrative of that so people will perhaps understand what these differences are. Mr. Emery, do you want to comment on that? No, I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Derek Penman, um, uh, and that, is, that will form a part of the review going forward. The uh, SPA's part of that is the public concerns and, and, uh, and how local communities are affected by some of these decisions. And that's, that's the complementary part of the two reviews. 
And you'll be looking at the standing authorities that were in place in Strathclyde and Tayside previously, um, and there's a debate about Northern uh, to see how those decisions were taken and what the checks and balances were at that point too? What we were looking to do actually was, was, was more actually just state the facts in terms of what was there at the time. So, for example, in Strathclyde with a standing authority with ARVs, in, you know, in other parts of the country there would have been something different and it was for us to actually state what was effective for the operational deployment around ARVs, around standing authority, around the mode of carriage. Um, it wasn't our intention to go back and look at the, the, the governance of those previous decisions with previous police boards, but we did feel there was value in us looking at what was the position prior to Police Scotland in terms of operational cover, eh, firearms cover. Do the SPA t intend to go back to previous decisions, Mr White? Well, I, d I don't think it's for us now at this stage to review previous decisions, but part of what we wanted to look at was what was the picture around the country, and that's the nature of the complementary work we're doing, is that we set out a, a, a set of issues uh, that we wish to look at. We became aware uh, of that Mr. Penman's review would look at a number of these, and so it's, uh, we've, we've allocated the tasks out to the best scrutiny body to do that work. So where it's about uh, an operational or a, a specialist policing role, uh, HMICS will do that, where it's about interaction with the public and gathering the public view, uh, and then taking that into account, then SPA will do that. I, I'm grateful for that, because I think one of the other myths that is growing here is uh, this myth that there is a lack of scrutiny. And personally, having served in a police board myself for um, 13 years, I think the scrutiny uh, set up now is, is much greater than it was then. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you do in, intend to, to, to look at that too. Um, the, the thorny question of, of operational independence has been one that's existed um, for a, a very long time. Um, and I, I think it would be very difficult, as the convener suggested, to come up with a, a, a definition. Do you think that in terms of, of some of, of, of what has gone on here in your reviews, um, that it opens up communication uh, for, uh, for uh, ensuring that future uh, decisions that are taken um, are related and communicated uh, to yourselves and also to the public so that we don't get into a situation where, where certain things uh, become, uh, as I've said previously, a bit of a myth. Well, I, I share your, your view again. Um, I think um, this is not the first item that where we've had communication issues which has led the public to a wrong conclusion. Uh, and it's all been down to communication, and we do need to communicate better with the local authorities uh, and, the, and the people that live in the areas which will be affected by the decisions that are being made. And there needs to be a more mature dialogue between the SPA, HMIC, and the police with regard to some of these proposed decisions or changes of direction going forward. Uh, I think in the past, Mr. Penman has uh, seen me challenging uh, chief constables uh, before, but I think it's absolutely uh, uh, right that we ensure that there is not the, 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 the political interference round about um, certain areas. Can I ask in terms of the, um, the, the communication with yourself and, and the knowledge uh, exchange uh, with the SPA, can I ask, are, are, are SPA members, do they have security clearance to get certain information? Uh, yes, I do. In fact, myself, I, have, I am what's known as DV'd. I am deep vetted, uh, so I can look at... <laughs> Actually, it was. <laughs> Anyone that's been through a DV process knows how painful it can be um, because they, they go into every aspect of your life. Um, uh, so I am... I am politicians. Pardon? We're not, are we DV'd as well? Thank goodness. I, I don't right. think we should have that debate, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, is it just yourself, Mr Emery, or is that all members of the board? Uh, all other members of the board are uh, security vetted, uh, but I am deep vetted so that I can look at some of the covert stuff and some of the uh, high threat uh, risk analysis that gets done. Thank you. I think that's been extremely useful. Thank you. I think, I think because you referred to the... I've managed to get the thing, and I'll quote it out, if that's all right. And I think I've been fair in quoting... It was Alison McInnes's question, actually, the 20th May uh, this year, column 31153, 
And the part I think certainly is, this is the Cabinet Secretary answering, I was aware that as we ran into the establishment of Police Scotland, three forces were already operating the procedure that is now the standard procedure in Scotland. Officers in those forces numbered over half of the establishment in Scotland. I repeat for Mrs McInnes's benefit that those forces were Strathclyde Police, Tayside Police and Northern Constabulary. Constabulary. I was aware that as at 1 April, the Chief Constable was going to ensure that we had a similar regime operating across all Scotland. So that puts it, if you're content, that's now on the record, which you refer to. And can I say to members, it's helpful if you're going to refer to something to maybe even have the column reference or whatever, so that the record can link it up. Thank you very much. I move on now to Roddy, because you've not been in. And then I'll yeah. take Graham, John and Alison. Um, good afternoon, gentlemen. I wanted to move away from uh, just a kind of a discussion generally about operational independence and just really kind of probe a bit further into the comments that Dr. Plasto was making and the methodology, uh, the assessment of uh, whether the Police Scotland's conclusion was supported by prevailing threat, risk and available intelligence. Could you perhaps put a little more flesh on how you're going to go about that? Um, yes, I'm going to take possession of these documents on uh, Monday afternoon. That's been agreed with Police Scotland, and then uh, we'll um, review the content of those documents. Um, because, as I said previously, the um, you know the uh, intelligence information will either be there or, or it won't. Okay. Good. That's anybody else? Does anybody else wish yeah. to comment, Mr. Penley? Uh, just add as well. Oh, we're, we're conscious that the, the Chief Constable has got an undertaking that, in addition to the, the the strategic threat assessment, which is a document that's produced the guidance, that he would also take um, cognizance of views and representations. So one of the areas that we're also interested in is to see what they are and the extent to which they are also considered as part of that decision. Graham, and can I can I say that I'm trying to move on? I know we because we've got to finish by two thirty. So I'll take Graham. If it's a short question, Graham. It's just a couple that relate to each other. Okay. I don't think it should take over Good. And then I've got John and Alice. Okay. Um, governance uh, means bringing someone to account and knowing the way forward, and policing by consent. Consent can only be offered when people are aware of the policies and have agreed with the content of those policies. So I think my earlier questions indicated that I'm, I'm very dissatisfied with the nature of governance thus far, and to that extent, I have some distance with uh, Kevin and some of the comments that Kevin made earlier. But in the current arrangements, we've had the firearms policy in place for more than a year, and there's a requirement for an annual review of, of that policy. Do we have that review document? Has HMIC uh, had access to it? My second question was, in a comment that um, HMI, I think, made earlier, he said that, in, in your view, the Chief Constable made an operational decision, etc., etc. I wonder how do you make your mind up at this stage that it was an operational decision to maintain uh, these officers on armed patrol when we don't have any paper which justifies the situation. So if you can tell us, where is the annual review which is required as part of the arrangements, and can we see it? When was it published? And secondly, would you roll back on, in your view, when you're now engaged in a review at this stage, and I think you'd be better waiting until you achieve the outcome of that review before you make up your mind about whether it's an operational a decision or otherwise. No, no th thank you for that. In terms of the, the annual review, as I said, the, the guidance <coughs> requires an, an annual review of that decision. Um, we, I haven't been cited on the, the annual review uh, documentation personally. We haven't asked for that. Um, I'm again, assuming that would have been done um, a year into the service. The next review is the one that's scheduled for September, and that's the one that we will be involved in. We'll look at the evidence for... Do you have an annual review? We, has the board seen the annual review? The, the, the annual review, which is now quarterly, it's a quarterly review. The, so the, the annual review, yes. that's the principles that are applied to yeah. standing authorisation. Have you seen the annual review 15 months into the process? The, the SPA does not do that review. The police do that review okay. internally. And I have not seen a document as a result of that okay. review. So we haven't fulfilled a requirement in that regard? We don't know if we have or not. The police have said that they do a three-monthly review. But as a board, 
you would require to ask the Chief Constable for that annual review, which well, should have dated from April last year? Well, we, we would, although we have some assurance in that they are accredited by the College of Policing, and as part of that accreditation, they will be required to undertake an annual review and I, my understanding is report that to the College okay. of Policing. I, I, I'm sorry, convener. Perhaps it's me. I know I can be a bit garbled on occasions, but I'm glad you said it I said indeed, it. when one starts a standing authorisation, it's agreed that there will be an annual review. That's part of the process, and that's part of the principles that apply. So, April last year, Police Scotland begin a standing authorisation, and part of that is we will give you an annual review at the end of the 12-month period. Presumably, that's what annual means. I would have expected the board to have been saying, April this year, can we see your annual review so we know where we are with this policy? But that hasn't happened. Maybe Mr Penman can help with this as well. But my understanding is Police Scotland undertook to do an annual review internally. And the, the, the issue about having an annual review was not reported to the SPA at the time that the information was given to us, the brief information that you highlighted that we discussed in Selkirk, uh, that inf the, there wasn't a lot of detail about annual reviews or anything at that time. Yes, Mr. Penman. The point again, the, the guidance requires the Chief Constable to, to review the decision, and the guidance says it's an annual review. My understanding is that Police Scotland don't do it annually, they do it every quarter. So there, will, there should have been a number of reviews undertaken since that period. And the next one that is scheduled is in September, which is the one where we will see the content uh, in relation to that. Uh, but, but can, 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 I'm, going to, I'm going to. I hear you've got a point, but I think I think I'm hearing no, about quarterlies and annuals. And do you want to explain further, or we can we? Perhaps just one point of clarification around um, the, the sort of preempting of the operational decision, um, which was the second part of Mr. Pearson's question. I, I think where I'm coming from in relation to that is that the decision to deploy firearms under a standing authority is rightly the decision for the Chief Constable. It's the Chief Constable under Section 55 of the Firearms Act, and it's also in line with guidance that is produced by the, um, the, the College of Policing. And its compliance with that guidance would make it a decision for the Chief Constable. So if I could perhaps just clarify my, my own understanding of that, when I'm saying it as an operational decision for the Chief Constable, it's because legislatively and within the guidance it is appropriate for the Chief Constable to take that decision, is, is my point. The Chief Constable, to my mind, is also accountable for that decision, which is a different matter. So when I'm saying it's a, rightly a decision for the Chief Constable, it's based on statute and guidance around that. I'm going to read this later because my head's burling a bit with <laughs> annuals, quarterlies and so on. Now, I've got three members. Can I ask you to just put your three questions and then I'll get them answered in a one or because we have to move on the latest at, say, 2.15. Uh, so, John Finney, a question, Alison, a question and Kevin, a question, please. Two, two brief questions. <gasps> oh, one. Just say it's one question in two parts, and that sounds better. <laughs> well, whatever. Um, I thought our job was to, to scrutinise here. Yes, I think, well, yeah. We have yeah. To sit, we have okay, to move well, by um, it's, it's for Mr. Mr. Penman. And it is about the very pertinent point that Mr. Stewart made about myths. And I think there's a myth that needs to be dispelled. It uh, arises in the first response I get. I'm the individual who raises this issue, as you well know. Um, and it's the response I get from ACC Higgins, which says that part of the rationale for this change was it could take up to 20 minutes for an officer to arm themselves. Now, if it takes an individual 20 minutes to move a firearm from the boot of a vehicle and put it on, then not, in my opinion, not only should they not be in charge of the firearm, they shouldn't be in charge of the motor vehicle either. But perhaps <laughs> you, you, you could look at that. Mr Penman, the, the, the area that's mentioned in your report that, uh, that I think could become very pertinent to this, and, and it's, it's alluded to in the information that the convener read out with the term similar regime, is the phrase equal access to specialist support and national capacity. Now, as, 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 as you'll know, to treat people equally, it doesn't mean that you treat them the same. And what's required in Govan might be different from Goldsby, Leith from Lerwick. So I want to understand the extent to which that understanding impacts on the geographic deployment. Because, you know, if, if there is a rationale for deploying in the greater Inverness area, then why would these individuals find themselves out with that area? So it's the extent to which that principle, if you like, of the change to the single force impacts on the operational deployment, please. One, I hope you've taken a note of it. Alison? Okay. I have a question round about the standing authority. We've not only the policy 
change to a standing authority doesn't just mean that the officers are carrying their guns overtly in their holsters on their hips, does it? It also means that those individual officers ha are the ones that decide when to deploy them and de decide when to fire them. Is that correct? If that is correct, will um, Mr Penman, um, in his uh, review, consider whether the risk um, that's been posed or that the, the, the Chief Constable sees is just justifies the removal of the supervisory oversight of a senior officer? And as I understand it, a senior officer would have in the past um, had to agree that the guns could be used on each individual occasion. And that, that, that authority yeah. has been devolved directly to the individual officer carrying the gun, is that? No, that's, that's thankful. That's a clear question. And then, Kevin, what's your question? Uh, my question is, is uh, in a similar vein. Um, I've got a quote here. I think that my officers have the right to be protected and also have a duty to protect the public. Uh, that was Graham. Uh, some years ago when he said that he wanted his officers to carry firearms. Now, in terms of the standing authority, the point that Alison has just made just now um, is the, the fact uh, that sometimes officers should have the right uh, to use a, a taser or a firearm uh, without having getting that supervisory authority. Are you going to look at incidents uh, that have happened of late um, uh, including one in Edinburgh of late, where firearms officers had to use a taser um, very, very quickly after an officer uh, had been stabbed in the street. I'm going to take these questions first because I know there's a bit of a debate here between you, but really there's a question here. There's the question about equal access to specialist support. Why should it be the same throughout that's happening throughout the geographical area when it might not be suitable. I think that's what you're talking about. The UNRWA is a standing authority where we understand you had to get, you had to phone up a superior officer before you could make use of the firearm. Are you going to look into the fact that that has changed? And the other was, sorry, I forgot your incidents of... Uh, I, I want them to be able to look at incidents um, like the one that recently took place in Edinburgh to see how any changes to the rulings would actually affect these circumstances. Uh, can somebody take those, please? Um, Mr. Penman. Yeah, in terms of geographic impact, I think you raise a valid point uh, in terms of that. Where previously, you would have had the eight forces who would each have an individual threat assessment. What you now have is a national threat assessment. And I suppose the question you're asking is how does that play out across uh, the whole geography of Scotland um, from that? And that will be one of the areas that we would be interested in looking at. Again, you may, you may still have... Um, a need, if, if indeed that need is justified, to have immediate access, but there might be issues around the deployment. Um, again, these are separate issues, as I spoke about, but it's something that we will, we will look into uh, as part of that decision as well. In terms of the standing authority aspect, previously what would happen is the, the, the firearms would be secured within the vehicle. Um, there would be a call for a firearms instant, and there would be a commander, usually the control room inspector, who would authorise the, the officers to then deploy and use the firearms. It then becomes a firearms operation, and that operation is then subject to level of command. In the main, that would still happen for the vast majority um, of incidents that are there. What standing authority covers is effectively for, for something that would happen so almost so spontaneously uh, around there that the officer would have immediate access to firearms, where they're then relying upon probably very limited set of tactics um, to deal with something that's happening there and then from them. And again, the officers are trained uh, very highly to deal with these scenarios as well. And as you say, the decision on whether to use the weapons or not are absolutely with the, the individual officers. So it, it's not, this hasn't passed everything across to officers now to say, you, you're now authorised, go and deal with a firearms instance. If a firearms instance happened, it would still be uh, commanded in the main from uh, an inspector in the control room. And if it then grew, it would then be of other firearms commanders attached to that. So the standing authority is, is very limited, really, for a narrow set of circumstances where officers may be required to um, bring, bring, bring firearms to deal with a situation that they're almost presented with. So just to clarify, it's not... They're not locked in the car anymore. That bit's gone. But in certain instances, they have to call in and say, I think I require to use this. They, they've got the firearm with them, but they have to get authority to use it. In other instances, using their judgment, they can just use it. That would be an extremist, to be fair. I mean, yeah, but I, there's these... I, I hear you, yeah, but yeah. that's what you're telling me. Yeah. Effectively, what would happen, if a, if a call came in, it required officers to be, um, to, to be armed. They're actually they're armed already, so they have the weapon with them. It would still be commanded as it would have been before, where you would have a command and control situation from a, a control room. In some cases, you'd have a bronze commander and an, another person who would actually be involved in commanding that firearms operation. So what it is about is actually the officers having immediate access to that firearm if required. 
And the only time they would actually use them without going through a chain of command would be if there was something almost presented in front of them that required that. Whether or not the actual carrying of the arms is exacerbating the possibility of that situation arising. Probably that would lead me into dealing with uh, Mr. Stewart's point, which is we can, you know, we can look at all the deployments, all the armed deployments that. Uh, the, the, well, yes, and the, every armed deployment is actually reported to the, the PERC, so they would actually review them uh, on their own merits as well. But uh, as part of the firearms threat and risk assessment that the Chief Constable would consider, he would also look at the deployments across the, the previous uh, period, if you like, to see to what extent have firearms been used, because that obviously would inform the threat. So there's an element of that being built into the review process within policing, but it's something that we would look at as well to see um, effectively how have these um, weapons um, been deployed, uh, if at all. Kat, I'm sorry, I haven't worked out. When are your reviews going to be concluded? Have you got a date for those? By the 21st of October. <clears throat> and the SPA? Uh, um, certainly by the 17th of December when we hold a, a, a board meeting. We may have an interim report in October, but obviously part of our report will be influenced by Mr Penman's report, so uh, there will be considerations around that at that Will stage. that interim report, would that be a published interim report? It will be an update to the board at that meeting. OK, so it's a public, so it's public document. Public. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I want to... I know it's frustrating the time we have, but we can't sit when the Parliament's sitting. Can I thank you very much? I'm not wanting to have I a little spat. No, I'm not... I I, you, no, 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 there. no, I'm sorry. I'm, thank you very much. You can take it up with Kevin. It's nothing to do with the witnesses. The can I thank you very much uh, for your evidence and uh, conclude that now and move into private session? Thank you very much. You too, sir.